Liz, we're live and we welcome back to Author Adventure. Liz, how are you doing today? I'm doing great today, Russ. How are you? Excellent. I love excellent. technology. It's such a great thing. When it works, it's fabulous. And when it does not so much, well, it's kind of frustrating. But we are going to work our way through all of these things. So well, glad to be here today talking author adventure. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wanted to start off author adventure with a little bit of uh some tips. I know we have some tips that we're going to be talking about today. So do you want to, do you want to get us started by uh, sharing a few tips with us today? I will. So as we've talked about here, this show is all about the art and business of publishing. And we're talking about the five secrets to success. And every week we're sharing some kind of tip, some kind of secret. In our minds, there are five things that you need to know about on your author adventure. That's writing, that's publishing, launching, marketing and distributing your book, your best-selling book. So uh, that's what we're doing. And so today, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about some writing strategies and secrets. And then last week, we talked about some publishing secrets. Today, we're going to talk about launching secrets. So there's three things that you need to consider before you launch your book, before you publish. The first one is to have a promotion plan. Create some kind of a promotional plan how you're going to promote or market your book uh, when you launch, okay? Because that's a really important thing. A lot of times people wait until they finish writing their book and publish, and then they start worrying about the marketing and the promotion. But you need to do that ahead of time, even if it's just a mini plan. Just a list of four or five things that you're going to do to help promote your book. The second thing is to create what we call a street team. That's five or 10 or 15 people that you know that like you, trust you, know you, and are willing to promote your book for you. You can send them the copy. You can send them the link to Amazon or wherever you're publishing, whatever platform you're publishing on. But you want to call them ahead of time. You want to call them a month out. You don't want to call the day before you're launching your book and say, oh, will you help me promote my stuff tomorrow? Well, no, people can't do that. They've got their own agenda. They've got their own work that they're involved in. So you need to put that street team together and you need to do that ahead of time, at least a month out, if not earlier than that, six weeks or so. The third is to set up a social media page. Um, maybe you're on social media already, but you need to be where your audience is. Wherever your audience is, that's where you want to be. So if your audience is on Facebook, Maybe you need to be on Facebook. If it's a business audience, maybe you need to be on LinkedIn. Um, if it's mothers, maybe you need to be on Pinterest. Um, if it's younger people, maybe you need to be on Instagram or Twitter or uh, TikTok. And you don't have to be on all of these platforms at one time, but you need to pick at least one so that you can put the link to your book, wherever your book's being sold. And so you can create your book cover or maybe a picture of yourself holding your book and send that out to people and tell people why they need to be buying your book. So those are the three secrets for launching that we're sharing today. We'll share more secrets each week. So come back for that. But today we're just really delighted to be uh, having our, our guest today. Our guest is author Mike Ferris. Mike is a multi-book author. He does mostly legal thrillers because he was a attorney by trade, uh, has retired now. But he's been writing all these years while he's been in um, the law business as well. And so uh, in addition to that, he's not really retired. He retired from the legal uh, aspect of things, but now he's teaching. So he's teaching at the university, and he can tell us a little bit about that. But today we're going to be talking about his nonfiction stories, one of his nonfiction stories, which is a current release called 40 Hours. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Liz, Russ, thanks for having me. All right. So, yeah, you know, Mike and I have been friends for a long time. We're family friends. He's uh, married to uh, a lovely lady named Susan, who I've known all my life, basically, because her sister and I have been best friends since we were like kindergarten, I guess, so uh, 50, 50 years or more. Um, and then when Mike married into the family, he just got stuck with all the rest of us. So, <laughs> but Mike did give me my first encouragement when I was feeling really discouraged about 30 years ago. 
he told me not to give up on writing and not to give up on publishing and to just keep on keeping on. And one day things would happen. And he was absolutely right. So here we are today with this author live stream. But I'm going to let Russ take over now and kind of talk to Mike about his new book. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll mention some of his other books toward the end. And maybe Amy can bring you back up, Russ, and, and we'll finish up with a few things. Thank you, Liz. I really appreciate this. And so, Mike, you know, I was going through your uh, prolific inventory of writing. And the question that I had uh, and I thought about, which was maybe something you haven't been asked recently, is what is your first childhood recollection? Oh, my first childhood recollection. Um, my dad was a Baptist missionary to Japan. And so I lived in Japan between the ages of two and seven. My first childhood memories are of being on a, a compound of English speaking families there in Tokyo. Uh, there were three, three boys my age, uh, and I have recollection of doing things with them, playing things with them, uh, playing cowboys, you know, playing baseball. That's pretty much my first recollection. You know, and the reason I ask this is because as an author, there's typically some seed that gets planted that um, or some idea that you you feel like it's something that is your calling or something that you're compelled to do, especially when you've written as much as you have. And I just wanted to kind of set the stage, so to speak, to what prompted you to get into writing and how did you involve your your life goals and some of the experiences you had along the way and how has that impacted your writing so far right well you know i be i became a writer because i loved reading i loved mm -hmm. books uh, i grew up on the hardy boys i remember that every year for either christmas or my birthday my mother would take me to the kmart in dallas and i could pick out a hardy boy book uh, so I grew up reading, and I grew up loving the storytelling involved in it. Um, I did some writing when I was in school, but not a whole lot. But then when I got into law practice, I, I began to read legal thrillers, just because that sort of went along with what I was doing, mm -hmm. and began to realize that the cases that I worked on lent themselves to stories. And so mm -hmm. the first novel I actually wrote was based upon a case I had that lasted for 10 years but it was sort of drawing upon my love of reading, my love of legal thrillers, and working on a case for so long. You know, during during the experience of, of writing a book, I know it's really, uh, it can be therapeutic, it can be uh, exciting, and also challenging. So, you know, for authors that are looking, that haven't started yet, they're looking to discover What's the best way to start? Do you have any recommendations or thoughts that you want to share with these uh, new authors that might be just venturing out, and put, put their toe in the water? Yeah, I think my best advice would be just if you have an idea for a story, just start writing it. Now, mm. educate yourself. There are books you could read. You can go to writers' conferences and seminars, and you could learn things to refine it. But my biggest advice would be just simply start putting down something on a page. Um, you know, it, it, it may never see the light of day, but it's a starting point. And I have always learned with every new book I, that I start, starting it is sort of the uh, priming the pump. You know, I have mm -hmm. ideas in my head and they start to come out as I start to write. So it's actually the process of writing that gets me into the storytelling. Ah, so... So it's almost the taking action and then yes. allowing things to unfold for you that that really kind of helps develop the story along the way. I think that's exactly right. And then the, the more you do it, the more you write, the more you can sort of refine your technique. You learn to outline, you learn to structure things. But when you're getting started, the most important thing, I think, is just to get the work, get the, you have stories in your head, get them out of your head and get them down on paper. Uh, and that's your starting point. That may be something that never sees the light of day, but it's what gets you going. But it's practice. It's like any instrument. You have to get your muscle memory. You have to get your your rhythm down. You have to actually allow yourself the, the space to think about these 
these topics. You you do. I, you know, something like people have asked me, do you write on a regular basis? Do you have a schedule? And my answer is always, I sort of write as the spirit moves me. When hmm. I start thinking about a story idea, I I think about it for a long time. You know, tossing things around in my head. What needs to happen? Who are my characters? And you reach a point where it's okay. It's time to come out of your head and get down on the page. Um, but the repetition and practice is important because I've I've now published 16 books and I have realized that what it used to take me seven or eight revisions to do, I now do on my first or second draft. And it's just again, it's the muscle memory. It's yeah. knowing what I'm doing, knowing how to develop a story. Uh, I still do a lot of rewriting, but not as much as I used to. <laughs> do you uh, do you typically work on one project or multiple projects simultaneously? I typically work on one at a time. Okay. Uh, you know, when I was practicing law, I had multiple cases going at once, and so you learn to sort of juggle things. But that's one of the beauties of being a writer when you're on your own schedule. Um, I, I get the story out and get the story done before I move on to something else. Now, I may take notes. Uh, you know, I have a file folder full of ideas. So mm -hmm. I may jot down notes and things that come to mind, but I typically like to finish a project before I move on to another one. Excellent. I, I really, I really, I almost get the feeling that, uh, you know, because you have these ideas and, and you, you capture little thoughts and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, character flaws or things like that. It's, it's, it's a journey. Each one is a, its own unique journey. And has, throughout these, uh, all of these publications, is there one that sticks out in your mind that was particularly challenging and, uh, you know, maybe caused a little bit of grief for you at times? Um, not really. There were some that were more difficult to write. I've, I've published two true crime books, mm. uh, which were, were not the easiest to do because I had to do a lot of research. I had to have access to trial transcripts, to police reports. Um, and, and coming from a background of being a lawyer, it's very important to me to get the facts straight. So right. the, the amount of research that went into it, I probably spent more time researching and reading materials about the case than I did actually writing it. So I guess you could say that that was more difficult to do, but uh, I had to satisfy myself that I was telling the correct story. Well, the accuracy of that, I mean, it has to be important in, in the story. It, you know, you have to outline the facts and the way that they're uh, organized and just delivered. Is, I mean, it's it's uh, hats off to you. I, I My mind doesn't work that way. So, yeah, it's and like, it, for, okay. it was sort of a natural for me. And you also uh, I've got a good friend who's a writer who was an Air Force pilot. And he told me one time that every time he writes one of his his military thrillers, he gets phone calls or emails from all around the country. You know, you got this detail wrong, or that wouldn't happen that way, or maybe it's changed since you were in the Air Force. And so when you're aware of the fact that you will have not just a, a reading audience, but a critical reading audience, you particularly want to be accurate when you're telling a true story. Yeah. I, I know that the uh, genre of, you know, crime and, uh, you know, some of the mysteries that are out there. It's an incredibly popular, uh, popular genre. And I, the thing that fascinates me is, is how some of these stories, there are twists on these stories that you just don't, you have to think that it's almost, um, it's not a true story. However, truth is sometimes stranger than fiction. Have, have you discovered that along your journey? I have discovered that. And, uh, I don't know who who said it, so I will t I will take credit for this quote, even though it didn't originate with me. That the difference between fiction and nonfiction is fiction has to be believable. Uh, <laughs> and the person who said that was responding to you know somebody writes something, they put it into a novel, yeah. and uh, somebody will read it and say, well that you know that couldn't happen. And the defense is always, well yeah, it really did happen. Uh, yeah. So you can have these bizarre twists in nonfiction and they're real and you don't have to defend them. But you put those same kind of twists into a novel and people will start thinking, okay, you're just making stuff up now. You're just embellishing to tell a story. Yeah. Expanding the story to, yes. to uh, get the, the shock effect in there. 
Right. However, uh, you know, I, I've uh, talked to a few authors uh, that have been police officers as well, you know, and some of the stories that they share are just you, you have to shake your head and say, how can this even possibly happen? And and they they reinforce that fact. It's it's like telling a story is is a magical process to me. And I love storytelling and I love hearing a good story and I love reading a gr great story. And and that that genre and and true crime and and that uh just fascinates me to no end so I, I applaud you for your work and thank you for your effort and every everything that you put into this is there anything that you're going to expand on beyond that in in the in the future that you can see or um develop other areas of of storytelling not that i can think of right offhand um when, when things come to me that I want to write, it, it's not like I can it pick and choose. It just sort of comes to me, and uh, I decide, okay, that's what I want to write. So I have never sat down and actually plotted out, well, I'd like to do a, you know, a historical murder mystery sometime. Right. If I have a story that lends itself to that, then I will write in that genre. But it's more a question of simply the stories come to me that I want to write, and then I just write it. What's the favorite thing that you love about writing? Um, I, I, I like being God in my world, uh, you know, when it comes to writing fiction, because I get to decide what happens. I get to decide who wins. I get to decide who loses. And, uh, you know, maybe it's just a control freak in being a lawyer <laughs> that wants you to do that. Um, but, but I, I like being able to control things in, in, uh, being a Baptist preacher's son, I have a very strong sense of right and wrong. Uh -huh. um, and I want to see the good guys win and the bad guys lose. I'm um, not sure I could ever really fit into a, a dwar, you know, where, you, where the bad guys kind of come out or there are no real good guys. I want good guys in my stories. Yeah. You want the good and evil versus the, the uh, unknown endings, I'm sure. Right. I do. And, and, you know, just because I want good and evil doesn't mean that I don't realize that there are some gray areas. Sure. Um, and even good characters, the good guys, have flaws. And so uh, that's kind of what makes the story. You know, we're human. Yep. And the characters need to reflect that. Well, we're all flawed. So it's it's normal to have, you know, a little little gray area there, and especially when right. you're writing some story about a, a character. Right. I really have to believe that the detail, or, you know, from your law practice is really aided in the in the details in the books. Do you get a lot of feedback normally like uh, we were talking about with the with the uh, military books versus the uh, mystery or the crime novels? You know, I don't get as much of that as he did, um, but you get some. And. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the things that it's kind of funny when he tells that story is because the people who critique it to him are military, but his yeah. vast audience is out there. They don't know. Yeah. Um, and so the, what I have to struggle with, particularly if I write a legal thriller, is I don't want to bog it down with legal jargon and legal procedure. There needs to be enough so that the reader understands what's happening, but then I keep the story moving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a fascinating skill, too, because telling a story, uh, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day or an audio book, and they were talking about the, the crafting the story. And some of these podcasts, uh, really popular podcasts, they'll record 40 hours of content and boil it down to 90 minutes of content. And it's picking and choosing what elements go in what order and how that story is crafted. Uh, you know, for myself, just being a, you know, somebody that writes a blog post or, you know, some sort of content for social media, you know, it's, I just start it and I write it and, you know, a couple of edits and I'm done with it. Do you have to go through a process of where you're changing chapter or maybe you'll change orientation of, characters where they move and where they coming from and what they're doing i do uh i i uh when i first started writing i just you know i'd have a story in mind and then i would just write the story and go forward and what i've learned is that that good storytelling sometimes is about setting up the unexpected 
and so the structure becomes important. Um, mm-hmm. And I have had I have had stories where I've sort of started at the end and then gone back to the beginning, or I've started in the middle and then gone back to the beginning. I've also had stories where I reach a certain point and I had it in my head the story was going to go a certain direction, and then I realized that doesn't work. You know, these character I've developed the characters enough now to know that these decisions are not the decisions they would have made. And yeah. then you've got to go back and rewrite the stuff before it to set everything up. So, uh, you know, structure is incredibly important. I typically, though, don't structure it up front. I tell my story, and then I go back and move things around to fit the structure that I need. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I really uh, I really admire, you know, great storytellers, as I'm sure you do as well. Do you have any resources that you look to and you you study or, you know, you know, like the hero's journey or, you know, different storytellers that you've seen in any kind of media that you admire as far as how they tell stories or the structure of their stories or the surprising um, elements in their stories? Yeah, I you know, I I'm familiar with the hero's journey and, and some of those things, but I I learn more from reading the people who write the genres that I like to write. Ah. So uh, I see a Robert Crace or a Michael Conley or a Robert Dugoni, people Uh like that, and I I see the things that they do, uh, and sometimes I see the things that they do and say, gosh, if only I could do that. Uh, And then sometimes I think, well, maybe I could do that, but not exactly the way they do, but in my own style. Uh But I, I pick up less from reading books about writing than I do from actually reading good writing. That's uh, a friend of mine who's an editor uh, suggests every author do that, learn from good writing. And uh, so that's a great tip. And it's something that, you know, the author adventure that we're talking about here with Liz is we really want to reinforce this idea that there are things you can do. There's a personal journey and there's a professional journey for, you know, taking the step into becoming an author. And there's a number of different ways you can start. And there's a number of different ways you can, you know, continue to write. However, you have to find your own voice. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've done. You know, you've found some resources that you love, you enjoy the process and you write when, you know, when you're called to write. And so it's, it's, it sounds like a, an amazing opportunity and the number of books you have out <laughs> reflects the, the fact that you're not getting tired of it anytime soon. Not yet. And I, like I said, <laughs> I have a, I have a folder full of ideas. Um, you know, I, and I, I have one in mind that I'll start soon. I've just finished one. Uh, I always like to take a little bit of time off to sort of relax, but, uh, ready to start a new one, and I've, I've picked it out. But sometimes the hard part is deciding if I have too many ideas in that folder, which one do I want to do next? Yeah, yeah. Spin the wheel. Yes. Which one is going to come out next? Yes. So what is, what's the latest project, and what are you excited about these days? Uh, the one that I've just finished is uh, it's called 40 Hours. When I was nine years old, my father was in a plane crash in, in the big thicket of East Texas. Uh, Mm. It was a private plane. He and the pilot were the only ones in the plane. The pilot was killed in the crash. uh, And my dad spent 40 hours on the ground with a broken back, paralyzed from the waist down, before he was discovered by uh, Civil Air Air Patrol, uh, spotted the wreckage of the plane, and a ground crew found him. I have information from him. uh, I I have an audio tape of about an hour and a half where he talked one time with some of his students. He was a seminary professor. Uh, about the events of the 40 hours. And so I had been thinking about it for a long time, but what I did was I basically took the, his story as told in that tape, um, other things I had heard him say and write about, and then wrote a version of what happened on the floor of the big thicket. Now, I, I had to you know, use some literary license because I wasn't there. Sure. Uh, but it was, it was a, a very personal project for me. Uh, the book came out two weeks ago. I'm very proud of it. Um, 
but it it uh, it was very personal and it was sort of a passion project. Hmm. Anything that uh, evolved from that story that uh, that surprised you? Uh, no, it did because again, I you know I knew a lot of what had happened. Uh, he when he talked about the events, he talked about the fact that he was sort of he it was a lot of introspection and self analysis. Am mm-hmm. I here because I have gotten out of God's will for my life? I mean, am I here on the floor of the big thicket, paralyzed? because yeah. I took a wrong turn somewhere. So, mm. you know, I sort of picked up on that and some things that he wrote about. The The one thing that I did that i particularly proud of, I didn't want it to be just a, a book uh, of his thought process and his introspection. So I came up with a device of having the, the pilot who was killed appear to him either as a ghost, a hallucination, or maybe an angel to mm. challenge him over the course of that 40 hours as he's working his way through these decisions he's made that have led him to this point in his life. Um, and so he has a conversation with the pilot. Um, and I, so far the people who have read it, particularly ones who do, who knew the story, who knew my dad have really liked that aspect of it because they get to see him basically argue with somebody about the decisions he made in his life. Yeah. That's uh, fascinating. And, you know, with you growing up in, in, in Japan and, and your dad being in, in, in the situation he was with, you know, teaching and preaching, it's really important for people to understand that, you know, that's a, that's a struggle we all go through at different times in our lives. Right. Is it cause and effect? Am I, am I here today because of the decisions I made? Well, absolutely. Are they necessarily something I can or cannot change? Well, let's, let's take a look at it. Let's in, and let's have some, you know, reflection on what we're doing with our life, right? Right, right. And you get to have the discussion about, you know, am I here because I've made a wrong decision and God's punishing me? Or am I here because I made the right decision? Things just happen. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I was able to, to work through a lot of that in my own life as I thought about his perspective there, uh, you know, it was in winter, uh, in January of 1965 and, wow. and what he must have been thinking and going through. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a dangerous situation where you're, you're not sure you're going to get out or survive or, you know, what the next hour is going to bring. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know that also one of the major milestones that you have in your life that, uh, really made an impact on people's lives was uh, a journey in the legal system and some of the the wins that you've made around uh, authors and and writing. And is that something that you'd be open to share and uh, expand on a little bit more? Sure, I could talk about that. And I think you may be referencing the the Fifty Shades of Grey lawsuit uh, that I was involved in. We may uh, want to stay. I don't know how long the story is, uh, having not heard it uh, firsthand. But I, I just really want to make sure that we give you enough time to to expand and share the things that are important to you, and have people realize that you know being an author is a journey, and there are a lot of aspects about it. So, uh, right, love to have you kind of maybe tap into it with a with a thrilling end. For the for the next opportunity to talk with you, <laughs> sure, yeah, I you know, and I can sort of give it to you in a nutshell. Uh, most people don't know it, but Fifty Shades of Grey, the, the trilogy of books, Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker, and Fifty Shades Freed, were originally published by a small company called the Writers Coffee Shop, which mm. consisted of two women in Texas and two women in Australia, who operated as a partnership. Uh, they published it as a, primarily as a print on demand, but also as an ebook. And uh, because they were friends, they did everything on online. Uh, they didn't really formalize their relationship. But when Random House bought the publishing rights to the books, one of the women, a woman in Australia, took the position that because there was no partnership agreement, there was no partnership. And that it was actually her company and these other women simply worked for her out of the goodness of their heart. So when it came time to sign the contract with Random House, 
Uh, she signed the, the agreement as the CEO of the company. Instead of using the company bank account information uh, and tax ID number, she used her personal bank account in Australia and her personal tax file number, which is like a social security number, that she gave to Random House. And then over the course of three years, collected about $45 million in royalties and didn't account to her partners for any of it. Wow. So I represented a woman who lived in uh, over near Fort Worth, Texas, uh, in a lawsuit to establish that the Writer's Coffee Shop was a partnership and that my client was a partner in the partnership and she was entitled to her share of the profits. Um, we had a two-week trial in Fort Worth and we got a jury verdict, uh, basically awarded my client $13.2 million as her share of the profits in the company. And then they appealed, the other side appealed and we settled it on appeal. Um, but my client was happy. I was happy with the settlement. And uh, that's actually the last thing I did before I retired. What a great way to retire into being an author. <laughs> it was it was a great way to retire. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting case. Uh, you know, I mean, just the, the circumstances of the book made it interesting. And I've told people before, my client, uh, I actually had two clients who were involved in the lawsuit. In all the years I've practiced law, I can honestly say these two women are the only clients I ever had where literally, if they told me something, it was true. Yeah. Uh, you know, most clients will fudge things. They'll, you know, they'll try to de try to deceive their own lawyers. But if one of these women told me something, it was true. And I usually could find an email or a text or something to confirm what they said. And and it is a very uh, luxurious feeling for a lawyer to go into a courtroom in front of a jury of 12 people and have confidence that they will see the client the same way you see the client, which is, I'm telling you the truth. That is, that's a beautiful thing, Mike. Yeah. It was and great. What, a, what an adventure in storytelling. I mean, that, that, you know, a few people have heard of that story, Fifty Shades of Grey. And uh, so I suspect that that will uh, live on for a little while now. I want to I want to share. I created a little something uh, to share some of the books that you've actually. I hope all of the books that you've published, uh, and that Liz shared with me some images. And I just wanted to put a little thing together. And then I want to bring Liz back on and and wrap it up. And thank you tremendously for all of the work that you're doing setting the example for other authors that haven't yet started and also just being uh you know a key light in in this thing we call uh, the creative process so i really appreciate all the time and effort that you put out there and thank you so much for joining us as well, well Mike. thank you i've really enjoyed it i really appreciate it and let me uh let me just play this thing and then i'll bring uh, liz back and we'll wrap this thing up okay Thanks so much. Well, well, I just want to jump in because, uh, you know, Mike, we pull this down also as a podcast. So I just want to be sure that people know when you're looking for Mike Ferris, it's Ferris, F-A-R-R-I-S. OK, not Ferris Bueller, but Mike right. Ferris. You can find Mike's author page probably at www.amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Mike Ferris. And all of his books will come up there. You obviously can just go and uh, search 40 hours or you can, uh, you know, Wrong for Termination or uh, Death in the Islands. I mean, any of the titles, you can search by that as well. 
we'll have this copy in our description and our notes, Mike, as well. And we also do an article, a supporting article at our part of our newsletter. And Mike is graciously a, a guest author for that newsletter. And uh, he's talking about the fiction piece mostly because um, I do nonfiction and don't have a lot of fiction uh, background. Um, but this last story was a nonfiction story, and this uh, uh, Call Me Lucky, I guess that was a nonfiction, wasn't it, too, Mike? And, right, it was. And then Mike does some screenwriting and stuff, too, so we'll probably have to have him come back on maybe in November, December, somewhere like that, and talk about screenwriting, because I know that's a passion for a lot of people, and a lot of people want to know, what do you do? And that, it's really kind of, it's a whole different business, even though it's tied to the story. Is that right? Right. Happy to come back anytime. Yes. All right. Well, that'll be great. Well, anything else you want to say, Ras? I just wanted to be sure that people got uh, Mike's name right and that that would be on our podcast. And appreciate you, Mike, so much being here and, and very interesting. Uh, like you say, the questions that Russ had for you. And I learned a lot myself today. And I hope that people listening and watching. Um, that you'll take this, that, you know, you got to start with the story and go where the story leads you. And sometimes the story leads you <laughs> to places you didn't know you were going. Right. And life's thank you like very that much. Too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. All right, Liz, thank you so much, Mike. We're checking out. And uh, until next time, every Tuesday at five o'clock central time. And uh, we'll see you here on Author Adventure and uh, follow us on social. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much for being here. Take care, right. everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.